talk about the earlier history before Alan Bob. Okay. Does that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <coughs> And what about what year is are you going to start at? Just so I get a perspective. I'm going to start at. Let me think a second. Uh, I'm going to start about somewhere around I think 1963 or something like that. Okay. He said he started, but you're not really started yet. I'm coming. He started his story at 1963. He started it. So, <clears throat> you can start. Okay. Well, Triple I had sort of bootstrapped itself, and uh, uh, we had maybe doing consulting work and small contracts and so on, and we had maybe about uh, five or six people, uh, some were part-time students, uh, MIT graduate students and so on. And one of those graduate students uh, told me one day that his uncle was at uh, Lehman Brothers and was into venture capital. And so I, after talking to him, I, he told me that uh, he suggested that I send in a business plan to see if, if we would invest in the company. So I sent this business plan in, and I made a business plan showing what I thought the company could do, and blah, 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 you know. This was a long time ago. And I sent it in. I didn't hear anything for a few weeks, and then I got a short little letter back. So, uh, thank you very much for sending the plan in, but, uh, you know, here's what I want you to do. Try and do the same plan for half as much money. So I thought, that's a little weird, but anyway, so it seemed like an exercise. So I, you know, so I was always a bit flippant about almost everything. So I tried to do it for half as much money, and so it was easy to make a plan for half as much money. So I then said, well, let me try that again. <laughs> so if I can go half the half. And then I went half the half of that half and so on. And finally I decided, okay, I don't need any money at all. And that was the end of that. So about two or three years later, I met a party actually at Marvin Minsky's house for some reason. The, the student was named Paul Abrahams. He later became a professor at BU long later after he did a PhD thesis for me when I was a professor at MIT. That's how long it took. Anyway, um, I ran into this guy, and he turned out he was the guy at Lehman Brothers I'd sent this thing to. So I said, you know, I sent you this business plan, and you may not remember it, uh, but, you know, I tried to describe it. And he said, well, what's your question? And I said, well, you said, uh, you know, see if you can do for half the money. I wonder why you said that. And he laughed, and he said, look, I... I had a policy. I always acted the same way. What's that? I told my secretary to put the plan on the shelf and three weeks later send a letter asking if it can be done for half the money. And then if the person said yes, then he'd read it. <laughs> anyway, I don't know if he got rich or went broke, but I thought that was funny. That was just a little incident along the way. Let me see what else I made some notes here. Oh, one of the first contracts I got was from uh, ARPA. I got a contract from ARPA. Now, that wasn't so unusual because my ex-boss at Boat Brannock and Newman, where I worked, had gone to ARPA to make time-sharing happen. Time-sharing was an idea of John McCarthy's. John McCarthy was this fantastic inventive guy. Inventive guy. <clears throat> he came up with a... Uh, an idea of people sitting at a computer and doing things with it. <laughs> kind of the way all computers are used today. Oh, that doesn't sound... But the only problem was that a computer that could do something interesting cost about five million bucks and when he came up with the idea. Like an IBM 709 or something, which was still a vacuum tube computer. <clears throat> and 
and it was a large computer, and the way it worked was you typed up your program on, uh, onto a, you had a, you, you wrote it out on a special pad, which had a form. Here's the address part, here's the opcode part, here's the, uh, no, the location part, opcode part, the address part, the index register part, and then comment part, and so on. You just fill this out, you give it to a key punch person, you would key punch it on IBM cards, one card per instruction. You get a deck of cards, you would submit it for a run, you would bring it into the computer center. The next day you come back to find out, and if you, if you did it right, and you had a printout part that printed out something, and your program worked, you would find that out. If it didn't, you eventually learned to always print something out, you know, and so on. And one, the turnaround time between you type something, and you get a response was 24 hours at best. This is the way computers all over the country were. Now, uh, <clears throat> John McCarthy's idea was that the computer is fast enough that it could pay attention to one person and switch to another and another and another so rapidly that each person could feel he had, he, was, he had the computer to himself. And John invented something called um, uh, certain registers that would prevent your program from stepping on the data of another program so that if your program went crazy it wouldn't affect the other programs. They were called boundary registers. And he invented another idea, of relocation register, which was a register so your program would think it's in a particular place in memory even though it was in a different place in memory. So he came up with all these hardware ideas to make this possible. He told me all of that. And he had started a project at, at uh, uh, MIT to have that happen. MIT didn't think much of John McCarthy. Uh, he was in the electrical engineering department. And as far as they concerned, this was a stupid idea. You know, most people thought it was a stupid idea, even very smart people. And, um, uh, the, um, so what happened is um, I started Triple I, and John had told me that idea while I was at, at Pope Brannick and Newman, and we started, to, I figured out a way to do his thing on the little PDP-1 easily, because the hardware mods were easy to make and so on, and that was done successfully. So it sort of demonstrated that John's idea worked. And uh, so uh, when I started Triple I, I had John become one of the directors, and also uh, Marvin Minsky became the director, and Oliver Selfridge, because I was interested in artificial intelligence, and I had the three best people in the world in artificial intelligence. And if anyone had done AI in those days and got it done, it would have been us, but they haven't done it yet, so I'm glad we didn't concentrate on that. So in any case, there were three of the directors and me. I have to tell one anecdote. We held our board meetings usually at a, there was a fancy restaurant on, in Boston, a very fancy restaurant, and they had private dining rooms upstairs. So we would hold our board meetings in the private dining room upstairs. One day, we're all walking there, and uh, you notice John doesn't have a tie. And this restaurant wouldn't allow you in. So I said, John, you got to have a tie. So he stopped in the store, and uh, I said, told John he had to buy himself a tie. So John's in the store, and suddenly he says, you pick out a tie. I said, I don't want to pick out a tie. He says, you pick the tie. So I said, that one. So John puts the tie, and he says, let it be known that the director, of, the chairman of the board, Information International, is such an authoritarian guy, he has to select the ties for the board members. <laughs> Typical of John McCarthy joke. So, <clears throat> anyway, um, you know, our company um, had all these fortuitous things happen. Just wonderful things. 
And um, one of them uh, was the um, uh, that Ben Gurley, whom I uh, kind of he, he was, to me, he was one of, there were two fantastic computer designers I knew. I considered them to be the two best designers in the world. One was Ben Gurley, the other was John Cobb. And Ben Gurley was the absolute master of simplicity. The PDP-1 was a revolutionary design, it was very simple and uh, straightforward, and you know what cost? A little over a hundred thousand dollars, and at BBN we had an LGP30 that we paid fifty thousand dollars for. The LGP30 we paid fifty thousand dollars did sixty instructions a second, six zero. The PDP1 we paid a hundred thousand dollars did a hundred thousand instructions a second. That's quite a jump for a little bit of money. And, uh, you know, uh, so, and, uh, you know, it was like a uh, almost magic thing. The wonderful thing about uh, in my relationship with, um, with uh, Ben Gurley was this. Um, first of all, I have to tell you how I met him, because that's a funny story. Um, and, um, this is before I started the company, so that may be a little out of place, but I want to tell this one story quickly. It was a 1959, uh, I think it was, was it 59 or 69? Spring Joint Computer Conference, 1959. Spring Joint Computer Conference. And um, it was in Boston. I went to it, and uh, you know there were these exhibitors there, and there was a tape drive manufacturer, and this tape drive uh, was uh, you know some company that were trying to copy IBM's tape drives, and they had like about uh, one horsepower motors on the reels with the vacuum columns. You remember those kind, where the tape went down a vacuum column and back up across the heads on a vacuum column up to insulate the, the motors, so the motors would go twist, you know, fast there, and the tape is moving slowly through it, and anyway, anyway. And next to it is this PDP-1. It's like I'm, I saw this machine, my eyes just about popped out of my head, it had a display scope, and they had programs displaying stuff in real time. I realized, wow, this is a fast computer, it's, you know, doing all this stuff. So I started talking to uh, ben Gurley about the computer, and then the computer just suddenly out there. And Ben Gurley curses and starts the computer up again. You know, this was the prototype, and then it runs a while, and then it drops dead. You know, so but in any case, I'm fascinated by it, and I decide I have to have one. So I'm walking away, and I see the there's this guy with the tape drives there, and, I, and he says, "Want to see this drive?" You know, and he, and this motor goes crunch with the tape drive. This is fast, but, you know, really used a lot of time. And I'm thinking, I, so I'm sort of looking at the tape drive and looking at the computer. There's Ben Gurley at the display screen. The guy says, watch this, and he does it, and the computer there stops. And the guy turned the tape drive on, Ben Gurley's computer stopped. So I go looking, and I see a um, a uh, what was used to shield a giant cable. It was a uh, open flat conductor that you could open up and put another cable inside for shielding, but it was just empty. And I said, "What to the tape drive guy? What's that?" He said, "Oh, I needed a ground." You know, in those days. So I, I decided I follow it around, see where it was connected to ground. It wasn't. It just went to the PDP-1 because they wanted it. Oh, no. So when I showed that to Ben, uh, he was very appreciative because he didn't, he hadn't figured <clears throat> Now, I credit that with one thing. 
I kept making suggestions to Ben, and he kept taking them. I'd say, you know, this computer ought to have an executing instruction. He said, okay. So I would, I would say, the computer ought to have such and such. He'd say, okay. The next, and so he'd change the design of the computer and so that when we ordered one, I had specified about five different instructions I wanted. I wanted a different printer. I wanted a this, that. He did it all. And how was that? And uh, I had previously at times talked to IBM and said, hey, you know, you really ought to do something with this computer. And they say, you want us to do something special for that one, you know? And they think of some enormous price. It was all crazy. So this was a, a whole revel revelation for me. So <clears throat> when I left BBN to start III, I was located in the Mill and Maynard. And I was a software guy, basically, even though I was interested in hardware. And uh, so I wrote, they wanted to have, commercially, they wanted an algebraic compiler. So I designed an algebraic compiler. And uh, I started DECUS, which was their users group for Digital Equipment Incorporated. I just, because uh, I copied the LGP30 users group idea. And I uh, started that. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> I was generally helpful to them. That they, they, wanted a, they wanted a set of double precision floating point software, you know. So I wrote that. That was interesting because um, uh, the computer did not have a multiply or divide instruction. It had something called multiply step. And uh, uh, so when I was... At, at, when I started the company and uh, I was doing that work for digital, uh, I, they had a subroutine for Motopi and a subroutine for Divide. And by that time, there were about 25 PDP-1s in the world. And they wanted floating point. So I said, OK, I'll write that. So I'm kind of methodical. So after I wrote this floating point algorithm, I, I uh, uh, wrote a test routine, which is I found, you know, multiply A times B and then, you know, uh, see if I get the right answer and then vary it a little bit this way and vary it. So I wrote a program to test the, the operations and something was wrong. I, kept get, I, did, I couldn't get my program to work. So I investigate, investigate, and my program used some programs that a guy named Alan Tritter wrote at BBN to do multiply and divide, and those programs were distributed with the BDP-1. So the 23 machines out in the field all used Alan Tritter's programs for multiply. So I finally tracked it down to, there was an error in the divide routine. <laughs> so all the machines in the field, and digital had eventually implemented divide instruction. They copied Tritter's program. All of them had that same error in it, which I found by checking out the floating point things. So they had to fix all those and so on. Those are little things that, you know, happen. Uh, uh, can I ask you a couple sure, of things? Well, you, you, when you're um, on the subject of MIT, um, did you know Stephen Coons? No. Did you ever run into uh, Ivan Sutherland? Yes. Can you tell I about did. that? Sure. Uh, Ivan Sutherland was a student, uh, and um, and when I was in business, okay, he was a grad student at MIT, and he did his thesis. I don't remember who his thesis supervisor was. It might have been Minsky, was it? I don't know. I don't. But anyway. What he did was he did his thesis on TX2, uh, which was he did it was called he did what he did was computer aided design, CAD like, uh, not take it back, drawing, uh, getting images on it and working with perspectives and and, and images on a computer screen and he 
found very general mathematical ways to do coordinate conversions to get perspective views from different directions. Uh, he pioneered in using, uh, what's it called? Uh, where you, it's not something like uniform, some kind of coordinates. Um, I forget the name for it. But it's a kind of different coordinate system and things like that that made the computations easier. So he did this thing, and the program was called, the thesis was called? Sketchpad. Sketchpad, that's it, right. And he made himself famous that way because he was on the ball and something good. So I, I knew him at that time. He was one, everybody knew everybody in those days. But there were so few of us. So Information International started out uh, kind of, you know, slow and grew mostly consulting and doing things, but I fell into this graphics area just naturally. One of the things that uh, I have an advantage is most people would look at some problem like character recognition and they would come up with what seemed to me to be crackpot ideas, by the way. I'll never forget, as long as I live, I visited the senior sort of design engineer guy at uh, the, what was the premier Linotype company? Linotype. Okay, that was the company that made the machines that put the type. He was going to do OCR. And he, he was an older guy. And he said to me, you know, how many, if we're going to scan a character, how many lines would you have to scan across the character to be able to recognize it? And I said, oh, quite a few, by all that, you know. He said, ha, huh, you're wrong. And I said, well, why do you say that? He said, because I've done some tests and you don't need to. You can do it with just... Just scan it, maybe four lines. That's enough. I said, that sounds very strange to me. He says, I have proof. I said, well, I'd like to see it. So he then did something. Uh, at Linotype, they had these beautiful cards that would have one character on the card, you know, like a two. So the font definitions were on these beautiful big cards. So he had made some transparencies with bars, like it might be a half inch bar, a space, a half inch bar, and a space, and he, and he would put it over the character. So now you have this, you're looking at this, say it's a two, okay, and some of it's invisible, one one inch bar is invisible, and then you have one inch clear, and so on and so forth. And he said, see, it's obviously it's a two. You put it over. Okay. Now, you you know, if you just saw one corner of the two in high depth, like you see it, you could tell it was a two if you you know, but um, he was uh, completely off track because that had no relationship to the idea that you could scan it maybe with four lines and then figure out what the characters were. And also, um, people didn't understand that uh, when you scan something, it's noisy and, you know, things aren't aligned and, you know, you got you to gotta have a lot of different ways to recognize the character and you have to bring, to do a good job, you have to bring the context into effect and all kinds of other things and that's, you know, a lot of problems that were, that people tried to solve analytically are being solved today by what's called big data. If you have a lot of data, in other words, if you've seen a lot of scans of characters and you have a quick way to ask, have I seen this before? That's a darn good way to do it, actually. But it takes a lot of memory. In those days, no one had a lot of memory. So, you know, most people misunderstood that problem. And a lot of the ideas people had were cracked up. So anyway, um, I'm yes, not wondering too much. Really. No, I was going to just uh, ask if you could tell the story 
because uh, I thought it was really quite a striking one, about how Free Press finally caught on. You told me a story yesterday about U.S. News and World Report and, yep. and the other magazines. Um, and then later when we were talking with Art Dorinsky, he added on to your story with the story about how Tron was uh, going to be on the cover of Newsweek in Time. Do you remember that part? Uh, no, I don't. That's okay. a fine.